Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm excited to talk about some of my latest research in terms of sustainability. I think that what is needed at the present time is an absolute revolution in thought and in action. Uh, people are going to need to reckon with the new millennium, and that's really what I want to talk about. I think the first thread into uh, the larger context is to ask about the waste that we see all around us. I think if you look at our culture, we have a throwaway culture. Uh, people buy what's unnecessary, they throw away what's still working, countless gadgets, new things, and people are gobbling up resources. If you ask why do people consume and waste so much, I think we can see that part of the problem is that we are self-conscious animals. We are organisms that bear a kind of self-awareness and a diminishment of instinctual action that makes humans most subject to cultural finishing or cultural rounding off to such a degree that humans are what, what might be called naturally artificialized. That is, we encumber a problem of self-relation and action and we need a sense of self-worth and value in order to quell organismal anxieties or action starts to bog down. Yeah, the human organism suffers from kinds of anxieties and it needs some sense of self-worth, some sense of self-value. Unfortunately, I think we can see the path that this has taken in the modern contemporary world. It's been a, an attempt to solve this problem by more material progress and by an ideal of self-sufficiency. I think we live in a culture that promises something like a person could be fully self-made or that they could not depend upon anything other than themselves. I think what we can see though when we step back and look at this that the problem is not working uh, I'm sorry, you know, when I say this, when I say it's not working, it's not working on both fronts. That is, waste is piling up, we have uh, ever-growing garbage piles, and people don't seem to be any necessarily uh, happier, or their lives don't seem to be any more significant. I think some people today imagine that their lives are going to be better if they're sitting on a beach and one person is fanning them when another person feeds them grapes. I think it's sort of the image that we have of our culture, as if more goods, more comforts, more ease, more convenience is what people are really after. I don't think it's true. I think that's part of the problem. I think we still have lots of forms of anxiety, depression, lack of relevance, lack of connection. I think what becomes more and more apparent, the more that we want to be really honest with ourselves when we look at the 20th century, it's that people need the kinds of self-worth that come from giving from feeling that they are relevant and from feeling that they've been more than provided for. They need to feel as if they actually have something to give and that they've contributed to the larger world and the community. Uh, the Nobel laureate Dennis Gabor in his book, The Mature Society, he says, I fall back on a homely psychology. People don't appreciate what they get without an effort. I think that's very true. I think what we need to do at the present is to maybe ask ourselves, how did we get into this present state that we're at right here? How did we get here? So I'm going to see if I can't in a couple of minutes, I know this is kind of a ridiculous task, but to give a thumbnail sketch of Western history going back around, so, oh, I don't know, 15,000 years or so. And we're going to give this really quickly. Uh, I want to talk about the progression from the earliest hunter-gatherer societies, which were largely small collectives, to the rise of agricultural societies and then up to Roman city-states. Now I think if we go back to the earliest peoples right, that we recognize as humans as they lived in hunter-gatherer societies, they seem to be much more honest about the human's desperate situation than we are. I think they recognize dependence much more openly. They were subject to seasonal rhythms and they experienced abundance and scarcity in a direct way. And they realized that self-sufficiency was impossible. That's right. They realized it was impossible, and in some way, they imagined a way to appease the powers around them, and the gods were invented in order to have someone to thank, to blame, someone to give back to. Ultimately, it gave cosmic relevance, significance, and purpose to people's lives. 
I think in some ways it represents the dawn of the awareness of what we call the human, self-awareness. I think it also helps us really shed significant light on the long and complicated history of sacrifice that we can find in Western human culture, Western societies. What we see is long periods, again, and it begins in the hunter-gatherer societies. See, they dealt with the problem of feeling relevant and of having something to give back, but they dealt with it in a way that one might say minimized the guilt and enabled to give back, but the conditions were of scarcity and abundance and in such a way that uh, it minimized social inequality. You want to think that you know, in hunter-gatherer societies, there were attempts to appease the powers, to keep abundance in flow and to stave off scarcity, but in those conditions, uh, inequality doesn't really, I guess, come to prominence because uh, there isn't accumulated wealth in the way that we find, for example, in agricultural societies. As we move into agricultural societies, you start to see a rise of more and more inequality. I think one of the things that's most important to understand here in the lecture that I'm giving today is that the origin of surplus in human societies, Western societies, was not merely an economic or practical activity. It was not. It was caught in a kind of heroic expiation where people wanted to give back to the gods in some way, give back to the mysterious powers. Unfortunately, with the rise of agricultural uh, societies and in their increased size and the eclipse of local relevance because these were able to handle communities of much larger size and people increasingly became more and more anonymous. And now you also want to realize that this was happening before any individual was consciously aware of what was going on, but basically literacy was setting in, money was setting in, and by the time you get to the Roman city-states, Social inequality was now a serious problem in the ancient world. Right? Lending was already there. And see, or originally surplus began as a kind of gift, but social inequality and the sense of self worth through social inequality and through senses of privilege uh, came, to be, came to be very bad. In fact, they were so bad that around 2,000 years ago, many people opted for Christianity because it promised the impending ending of the world. Here we are 2,000 years later, and many of us are still waiting. That's right. Many people, uh, they believe Jesus was the Son of God. Some people say he was a prophet. Uh, some people say they question the historical Jesus at all. Uh, we're not really sure what the point is to our calendars anymore. Uh, we do keep time back there. We say it's the year 2010. Uh, but we know at the very least it's been very helpful for compounding interest. Yeah. I think the way that we can really come honest with ourselves about the new millennium is to turn to uh, Alan Wheelis. In his book, The End of the Modern Age, he says you need to understand what really happened with the Copernicus Revolution. When Copernicus discovered that the earth was not the center, but the sun was the center, it simultaneously diminished the human sense of importance, but elevated our sense of, of awe in our capacity to know that about ourselves, to discover it. It was a twofold move. I think from my own perspective, what I'm most interested in today, in this millennium, is the possibility of bringing together science and some form of religion. I here am at Grand Valley, been here now about 12 years, and I see many Bible thumpers sometimes on campus. I've even seen one gentleman who gets very angry, and I've seen him shout at students and say, accept Jesus or you will go to hell. Now, for people who are out there who have any kinds of sympathies such as those, I want to ask you how much you can forgive. I think we need some very big, big forgiveness. Very big. Imagine, again, for those people who have those sympathies, imagine that it's Easter Sunday. And yep, Jesus is up and he's walking around and he has good news. He wants to tell you that God loves you, but he's a little disappointed. He says that God wished people would take better care of each other. And he wants you to know that there's actually a missing book from the Bible. He has an update for you. There will be no life after death for anyone. But God wants to know, can you forgive him? 
I think many people can't. That's right. And I think to those people who have their inheritance structure and all of their goods that they've now accumulated, and they now have had that sanctioned by the Bible, they need the belief in someone else to serve justice. It's a structural problem we've created in our society. I do think if people do want to find out more about the kinds of ideas that I'm talking about here and this notion of a biologically friendly theology, you can contact me here at Grand Valley or check out, this is my most recent book, it's at Purdue, it's called Sources of Significance, Worldly Rejuvenation and Neo-Stoic Heroism. I'm also available on YouTube, you can find me there, just look under Corey Anton. Uh, I want to round off my discussion here by talking about what this would look like, uh, a biologically friendly theology or something what could be called a theology of death acceptance. Again, I really do believe that there are some people who seem to believe that there is a train wreck and it's going to happen and they don't care. I think they feel helpless. They don't know what to do. I think there are other people who they see a train wreck and they think doesn't matter. This is a big dress rehearsal. God is going to clean up the mess afterward. I guess I want to ask, can we come to some courageous acceptance of the fact that there is one and only one community, the community of the dying? We're all dying together. I think you need to see death acceptance on two levels. Once we accept death, we start to realize that you can't postpone your decisions indefinitely. To realize that you will die is to realize that you can't do it later. You will have to decide. There won't be time indefinitely. And it also means collectively, we need to see that the, the more that people believe that there will be justice served in a life after this one, the more that they postpone the need to bring about justice here. Is there an afterlife? I have no idea. Uh, do I believe there is? I don't think that there is. But I don't think that someone should be disheartened by that. I guess I would try to say to you, think about it for a second. Have you ever noticed that by the time you found yourself, you've always already begun? Yeah, when you came to self-awareness, by the time you found yourself, you were always there. You weren't there from the bottom up. And I think on the other end of that, each of us, we all have a future. It's still outstanding. And it will be something like, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. Oh, you won't ever get to I'm dead. <laughs> if you get to I'm dead, you're not. And by that, see it for what it is. Life's eternal. Yeah, you didn't come into the world. You've come out of it. You're a place and moment of it. You're something that's doing. We need to recognize ourselves as places and moments of this world. I think science now more than ever has teaching us that we're not who we thought we were, that we are much older and much other than we commonly think. You are a place and a moment of all that has ever existed and ever will. Think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Life is all that anyone has ever known. Thank you.